All right, good evening, everyone. It's Sunday, ne Sunday night. It is August the 24th, 21st, not the 4th. Sorry. Where you at? I'm somewhere else. <laughs> Lord, bring me back to where I'm at. Here we go. Let's, let's look at the word you have for us, amen? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to continue on with uh, John 11, 23 through 27. And um, for those on the video, the Holy Spirit was just moving in, in, in our service, and uh, we felt led to pray for this lady named Terry. Uh, by the Spirit, he's, we, uh, the Lord's saying that she is healed. So, and uh, she's, uh, she's had stroke symptoms. Her, her husband, Steve, which is a cousin of uh, uh, Bill Lupton. So we're going to pray for her. And then uh, uh, for those in Tulsa who catch this, uh, uh, tonight we're going to pray for Darlene Lawmaster. She is, um, they, 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 they've moved her, they've done some different stuff with her insulin and they stopped, she stopped taking one of them because they can't, they're trying to figure out what's making her allergic and swelling. And when she stopped taking that one, it, it actually helped. But we just need the right combination and the Holy Spirit's touch. We'll take the Holy Spirit's touch and then the right combination <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, just so we're going to pray for her tonight. So here we go. Let's read uh, 23 through uh, 27. And then we will pray and we will proceed to go forward with this. So here we go. Verse 23. So Jesus is in the middle of conversation with Martha. So this is where we left off last week. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the son of God. You are the Christ, the son of God, who is to come into the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that your spirit breathed it out, and we thank you for the blood being applied, and we can be in your presence. And Lord, you can make this word very much alive to us today. And Lord, we just lift up this lady, Terry. Lord, we thank you for all the complications that she has gotten through, but Lord, the report is, is that the stroke symptoms have not uh, relieved. So Lord, we just pray by the power of your word, Lord, that you said that by your stripes she is healed. And, Lord, we thank you that you're on this, and, Lord, we thank you that you're doing this. And, Lord, we thank you that, that her and her husband, Steve, will have financial blessing. Lord, that everything will continue to work out because he's a minister of truth and justice, working as a sheriff, Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you for godly men. And now, Lord, we ask that you bless this family. And, Lord, just give, and, Lord, cause the enemy to pay back everything that has been stolen from them. And Lord, we lift up Darlene Lawmaster and we just speak to her body, be healed, be whole. Lord, we ask that you'll just completely heal her. And Lord, whatever combination of stuff she's supposed to take or not take, Lord, we just ask that they'll become clear, just as clear as day, Lord. And she will be healed whole. She'll, she'll be able to live, move, and have her being in you. And we proclaim Terry and Darlene to be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, well, the last verse I'm going to get to tonight is that he can do above and beyond and abundantly what we could ask or think. So, so we're just going to believe it because that's what he's going to prove to Martha. Well, I can do above and beyond what you're even thinking. <laughs> so here we go. Verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Yes, praise God. So uh, I, I, love, I love what the scholar titles this whole section, The Raising of Lazarus and His Consequences. Uh, when you do work for God, there's consequences. <laughs> it's blessing and good trouble. <laughs> there's bad trouble and good trouble, right? If you're going to get in trouble, get in good trouble. Get in good trouble for following and loving Jesus and believing Him at His word and watching His miracles happen. All right. So, um, let me read it again. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Uh, uh, Jesus said to her presently and actively, that's the verb. We understand that in English just fine. Uh, will rise again, future tense, middle voice. So, uh, he's definitely making a promise to her right now. 
he's telling her that, yeah, this is going to happen. And then see, you know, right there, right there's a teaching right there. God's timing. We don't know it. It drives us up the wall. <laughs> but he has his timing of things. It might be today. It might be the resurrection of all the believers. Who knows? But we will find out if we keep following. Amen? All right. So, yeah, there you go. There was a nice little mini teaching and sermon right there. All right. So the readers here will remember that Jesus came to wake him up back in 11. These things he said after that, he said to them, our friend, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I might wake him up. So as the readers, we already have the advantage that he's going to do something and it's going to be awesome. For the people in the story, they're not real for sure. So he will rise again, is what we get in this verse, and she just said that God will give you whatever you ask. So, if you look at uh, verse 22, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's 21, sorry, 22. But even now, I know, she says that in the perfect tense. She's going to say something else in the perfect tense here in a minute. I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. The cool thing about this study is we're going to see that Martha's faith is adequate, all right? Her faith is adequate to, to, to see something that, that God's going to do. She don't know what he's going to do, but she does believe him enough to see what he's going to do. And, and we'll see that in the next couple verses. So she's probably remembering his word that he sent back to her that this sickness is not unto death, but to the glory of God, and that's verse 4 believing that he's talking about the believer's resurrection. So, of course, that's what we all, today, when we read this verse, we think about it, and we know that Lazarus is going to get raised from the dead, but we, you know, especially when I preach this at a funeral, I'm, I'm comforting people that, yeah, you know, we're just, we're all going, yes, this is, you know, what's happened is terrible, we're going to trust in Jesus, and we know that we're going to see our loved one again, and that's the faith we're, we're working with there. But if we go back to verse 24... Oh, when we get to verse 24, um, Martha, you're going to hear Martha state that. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So you see her stating that, yes, Lord, I know what you're, I know what you're saying. And I believe, you know, this is what I, I hear you're saying. And, and I know that you're going to do this. But she doesn't know that it's going to happen today. If we go back to 639, you get more evidence of this, that Jesus is promising those who believe in him, because what's the big word in John? Believe, believe yes. And uh, we're going to look at 639, 40, 44, and 54. In this chapter, he, Jesus continuously says this. So 639 says, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all that he has given me I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up at the last day. Verse 40, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes, there's the big word, right, in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jump over to 44, and no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So, what is Martha doing right now? Believing what Jesus taught. Yeah, she's unaware that it's going to happen today, <laughs> but she's believing him. So let's go into verse 24, and we already talked about it. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So that right there proves that that's what she's thinking. All right, so she says to him presently and actively, yeah, um, the next ver verb is, I know. It's perfect tense. Now, this is really cool. Let's see if I can find it. Let's see. Let me see if I can pull this up real quick. I believe how the scholar wrote it was really cool. It might be the, the, the biblical scholar. It might be the Greek scholar. Let me see if I can find it. Martha said, I know that he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. Yeah, it was the Greek scholar. <laughs> the way the Greek scholar translated that was really cool. Here it is. 
All right, Greek scholar. Mr. Mounts. All right. Nope, it was Junior. <laughs> Anyways, some people translate it, I firmly believe, because she's using the perfect tense, I firmly believe, yeah, that he will rise again in the last day. Oh, sorry, that's when we get to verse 27. Sorry, I jumped some verses. But right now she's making that statement, and it's, and it's pretty strong. So she goes, I know, but in, in 27, when Jesus talks to her, she's going to say, I firmly believe, and that is the Greek scholar, which I'll, I'll read it to you when we get there. Moving on, <laughs> all right. And then he will rise again, again, f future voice. So she's, she's understanding the promise. Yep, I believe you, Jesus. So she knows that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day, meaning that she does not believe the promises for today, but, she, but that, she, that, she is, that she's in, but in the end. You guys see I capitalized in. Because the Bible, Paul does this, and the whole Bible does this. When they talk about salvation, they talk about it looking to the future. It's an experience right now, but it's also in the end, the second coming. The big Bible word, the big uh, Bible college word is called eschatology. They all, it, salvation always looks to the end. It's eschatological. There you go. I sped out all those words now. We'll move on. Now you can impress your friends at a, at a Christian social gathering. You know, woohoo, you know what eschatology is. All right. So... Study of the last times, eschaton is Greek, and then the study of, so study of the end. So there you go. That's what our Bible does. So I, I put this note in here, in here. Her hope and faith is what many of us have today, right? That's exactly what we have today. We firmly believe in Jesus. We know who he is. He knows us. We know that our loved ones that have passed, we are going to see them again in the last day. Our hope that Mel preached on great on this morning, yes, our hope and our trust, our faith, we're, we, we know. We know we know if somebody wants to take us out today because we're a Christian, that's cool. That means our work is done and we'll hang out with some people we know, you know. Yeah, praise God. All right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, she has that faith, obviously. She's there. She's right there. So, moving on, verse 25. She, so Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, you guys catch that. It's an I am statement, right? But he said two things. He didn't just say, I am the resurrection. He also said, I am the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall never, though he may die, he shall live. All right? Now, this is really interesting. This is an I am statement that he doesn't repeat twice. I'll show you all that. So let's go ahead and look at the grammar. So Jesus said to her, just in the aorist tense, meaning it happened. He says, I am the resurrection, right? I am, the word am is present and active, which is true. Right now, he's presently, actively is the resurrection and the life. All right. Uh, one who believes, it's, it's a participle, present and active. Yeah, that's true today. He dies. Or our, our, um, our uh, New King James likes to throw the word may in there. Even though he may die, that's a verb, it's heiress, it's active, but it's also in the subjunctive mood. That's why they throw the word may in there. Now, this is interesting. I was reading, um, see, that way people know I'm actually reading. I, I've read things in Bible college. Greek for the rest of us. The subjunctive mood can also mean... Um, uh, a, a general truth or a more general truth. It, it could be possible or probable, but it can also mean he's making a statement here saying this is the truth. Even though he does die, you could throw the word may in there and maybe they're talking about timing because death's all due to timing, right? Well, it's something we're all going to face and we do face with loved ones who go before us. But anyways, however you take that subjunctive mood, um, He's going to use the subjunctive mood in the next verse that's going to be really cool, and I'm going to show you something. This is the whole reason why you should have came to church on a Sunday night kind of thing. So anyways, um, yeah, so he may die, but Mounts just translated he dies, even though he dies. Um, will live, 
and again, that's a promise. It's in the future voice. It's, it's in the future tense, tense, right? And then also you guys keep seeing the middle voice. So yeah, um, the best thing you can do to yourself is give yourself Jesus. Yeah, that's how I look at the, the middle voice. So moving on. The resurrection and the life is another I am statement, right? So we'll go ahead and save time, but if you want to go back and look, he said, I am the bread of life, and that's 635 and 48. He said, I am the light in 812, but then he repeats it again in 95. He said, I am the door in 107, but also he said it again in 9. He said, I am the good shepherd in that same um, chapter in 1011, but then he says it again in 14. But these ones are not repeated twice. He just says them once. Makes them very interesting. But the cool thing is, is every time Jesus gives an I am statement, he'll give an invitation. What was he do with Martha? Do you believe? Yeah. So they are, they are, they are, they are solid I am statements, just like the rest of it. But this time he gives you two of them, but he doesn't repeat them. But he does repeat what he says when he explains what they are. So he does do that. He does give you the, the explanation twice. So, now this is really interesting. I really liked our scholar. Our scholar did some really cool work here and, 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 show, and, and, and brought something out. I really hope I can bring this out to you. It could be seen that the resurrection is explained in this verse, Right? So this is what the resurrection is. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And then the life is explained in the next verse. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I have never seen that. But when I've preached this verse in funerals, I've, I've said it this way. You know, my dad always says, if the Bible repeats something, it wants you to get this in your head. It wants you to understand this and grab onto this as the blessed shirt hope, you know. This, this is what you hang on to. And, of course, in a funeral, it's, these, these are good passages for us to hang on to. So I found that very interesting that the resurrection is he who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. Well, that gives you hope right there, right? Well, what about us alive? Well, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Well, there you go. <laughs> hope after hope, you know, the, the Bible really wants you to know. And which this lines up with the statement about never seeing death as a believer in 851. So we'll go ahead and take a look at that. In 851, he says, Most assuredly, that's an amen, amen statement, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Now right there it launches us into a whole, the whole thing about what Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. It might be, as a believer, we will actually never really experience what death is. We will just simply go from one existence to the other. And some people who have died and came back said, that's pretty much what it is. We just went, you know, I was laying there, and next thing I know, I'm, <laughs> I'm in a really beautiful place. And then, for some reason, you guys prayed me back or brought me back or the doctor shocked me good or whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's it's... If you if we take if we take the word of God literal, which I'm all for, um, when you slip into death, you slip into absolutely no pain, no discomfort. You're right there in the presence. Makes you want to go, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Especially the older you, yeah the older you get, you're like man, I'm I'm tired of this knee not <laughs> working like it's supposed to. <laughs> One of these days, this body won't have that problem anymore. Yeah. So, anyways, moving on. Good stuff, right? Good stuff. All right, verse 26. Now, this is one of the reasons why you should, you should have came out tonight. Here we go. Here's some good teaching I'm about to show you. So, verse 26 could be, could be a definition of life, of Jesus being the life. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die and then, of course, he asked her a really good question. And I always bring that out when I do this at a funeral. Do you believe this? Because if you do, you got comfort. If you don't, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So here we go. Lives 
He who lives presently and actively, well, that's what we're doing right now, and believes, what's the big word in John? Believe. Yeah, presently and actively. Do we presently and actively believe God right now? Well, okay, <laughs> well, we're in, for, as far as I could tell. Will never die. Now, that's, now, this is where it really gets interesting with the Greek grammar. The literal reading of this is, let me just, let me get it together here. Whoever lives and believes in me shall not not die. That's how it reads in the Greek. So you get the little Greek words um and ma. One means not, so does the other. Now sometimes they will team those two words up, and this is where the Greek gets really strong, and you can see that that is also working with the subjunctive mood verb. So here we go, Greek, Greek for the rest of us. Here we go. Never is, is really an over an over translation, but the construction, right? Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Where am I at? Not only is it in, emphatic, forever. Where am I going? Oh, sorry. The paragraph before it. So if the if the writer uses uma, the two Greek words, and the Aaron subjunctive, which he's doing here. The prohibition, the, the prohibition is exceptionally strong. Often translators will add the word like never to make the, pro, the, prohibition, the prohibition, prohibition more emphatic. So great for the rest of us, see? You can zoom in later and see. That's what I just read up there. All right. So when I was in uh, Greek class at Life Pacific College, which is now Life um, uh, Pacific University. Uh, Professor Duzik was explaining this to us, and he was saying, this is the way the Greeks will say, this will never, ever, 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 never happen. It's a very strong prohibition. What is Jesus saying? If you believe in me, you shall never, ever, ever, never, ever, not, not, according to the Greek, not, not, die. Yeah, pretty strong, yeah. So there you go. Whole reason to believe in Jesus and make church on a Sunday night. You get to learn this stuff. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So the, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. We got power, amen? We will, we will never, ever, 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 never, ever die. Now, then, then, yeah, finish up with the grammar. He says, do you believe, talking to Martha, presently and actively? Of course, he's talking to her about this, and she's presently, actively going to go, yes, I very much uh, affirm this. But let's, let's stop again. Back to 25. I am the resurrection and the life, right? Okay. Well, you get this sentence and the next sentence. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. You see... You see you see, the, we've seen John do this before. He's also given you a statement twice, using it as a positive and then a negative to say the same thing. So this, this, these two verses, you can base your whole Christianity on <laughs> right here and do pretty well, right? You guys with me? <laughs> Am I preaching all right and teaching all right? <laughs> I'm starting to preach a bit because it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah. So, so... You could take it as a resurrection and then the life, or you could take it as the resurrection life, both being explained in a positive and then a negative. But the promise is there, and it's repeated twice because he wants you to know. Amen? So good stuff. Moving on with all that, back to verse 26 notes. Martha is not promised here that anything more than what she's expecting to happen today, right? But he simply asks, do you believe this? Which, which is to say, do you believe, and here's the scholar, basically how the scholar takes this, he's, she, Jesus is asking Martha this, do you believe in the gift of resurrection and eternal life? Well, what is Martha going to do? Firmly believe and say, yes, I do, next verse. So here's our next verse and our last verse. Here we go. She says to him, yes, Lord, I believe. That's in the perfect tense. I'll show you that. I believe. 
that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. So she says to him, she says is the verb, presently and actively, I believe, believe is, is, is in the perfect tense, and you can see that mounts are... Our Greek scholar adds the word firmly believes because she said it in the perfect tense. So let me just read his translation to you. All right. This is what I thought we were getting to earlier, but no, it's in verse 27. Here we go. She says to him, yes, Lord, I firmly believe that you are the Christ. And of course, goes on, the son of God, the one who is to come into the world. So... She makes a very strong statement, yes, I do believe you. All right. The one to come into the world, that's present, and also the middle voice. So, when Jesus decided that he was going to take on flesh, the, the whole Christmas story in one verse in, in the very beginning of this book, which is 114, right? Yeah, 114. Jesus did it to himself. <laughs> If you're going to do ministry, you're going to do it to yourself, because sometimes you get down in the mud with people to pull them out, <laughs> right? Jesus came down to this earth. My dad preached a cool sermon on that one time. He came down to the dirt and the dust. He came down to the manure of this life. He was born in a barn, you know? <laughs> you know, he came down to, the, to, the, to how gross life can be and how dirty it can be and how muddy it can be, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you cannot accuse Jesus of not practicing what he preaches. <laughs> That's another thing about the Son of God. So anyways, she gives all these titles too, so we'll talk about that. So Martha, Martha confesses every title the believers of Jesus are to confess, that he is Lord, the Christ, and the Son of God. Now check this out. Let's go to, to verse 20, 31. This is where John stops in his book and tells you every reason why he wrote this. Oh, where, where am I at? Nope. I, 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 miss, I miswrote that, but I'll find it because I know where it's at. I look at it all the time. Okay, maybe it's 21. It's at the top of the page on this side. <laughs> so I'll, I'll find it. I will find it. Give me a second here. We're doing great on time, so it's, it's all good. He comes into the world. All right. Oh. I'm in Acts. I don't know why I'm in Acts. I was in Acts. It's a good it's a good book, but it's the wrong one that we're looking at. I'm sorry. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so I was right. Chapter 20 of John. On this side of the page, I was right. Right before 21, I knew it was the last verse. But these things I write that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God, that believe in that you may have life in his name. And she calls him Lord. You guys see that? She believes everything that a believer needs to believe at this present time in the story. So, and there's more evidence of that. You go back to 938, of course, in the book of John. <laughs> we'll see some more of that. Now, this is the blind man. What does he say to the Lord? Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worships him, right? So all you got to do in the book of John is believe and not give a title. But let's go back to the Samaritans in 442. They show adequate faith. Because remember, the book of John does distinguish between faith and saving faith. Adequate faith against, oh, well, he's some type of prophet or good teacher or whatever. No, there's, there's adequate faith to be saved. Here we go, 442. Now they said to the woman... Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that indeed, that this indeed, that indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So, 
they had adequate faith to be saved, right? Back to Martha. So she has, she has, she confessed every title there is to, to confess, and which he does, which he does not care to confirm, because remember this from last, from last chapter, which he doesn't care to confirm these titles with believers presently, but he lets their confession stands where it is. So when people would tell Jesus, well, I know you're the Christ, you're the Son of God, or calls him Lord, he just goes, okay. I mean, he doesn't really say anything. Well, last chapter we saw this, but he wants his works to confirm who he is, right? Now, remember the confession of Peter. Lord, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. He's like, good, you get it. Let's keep moving forward. He doesn't even respond to any title that Peter gives him. Same thing with Martha. And if you look at 10, uh, 34 through 38, and you might remember when we studied this a while back, Jesus is like, okay, I'm glad you, I'm glad you know titles, but he's talking to the Pharisees. I'm not going to give you what you want here. I'm just going to keep asking you, watch what I'm doing and figure it out. So here we go. 34, Jesus said to them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say to him, whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Remember when we studied that, he never did say that, but they were saying that. And if I, and if I do not do the works of my father, don't believe me, right? But if I do, though, though, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may believe that the father is in me and I am in him. So remember that from last, last chapter, he was saying, yeah, stop getting caught up in the titles. You see what I'm doing? Do you believe or not? And that was what Jesus cares about. So but anyways, again, Martha says all these titles, which is what all the believers are supposed to do. And then she also says, the, another thing she says, you're the one to come into the world. That's another title right there. So the one to come is the one from above, right? Go back to chapter 3. 3.3, three, three, Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, that's an amen, amen one. I say to you, unless one is born again, or sometimes that could be translated born above, he cannot, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then John the Baptist in his farewell speech, when he goes, I'm out of here, he gives us this. He who, is, he who comes from above is above all, and he is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. So Martha confirms everything that a believer needs to confirm in this book. You guys agree with me? Everything a believer needs to say up until this point. She is where her faith needs to be. All right. So, which means Martha has all the faith that a believer is to have up until the point of this book. And that's pretty much where the scholar ends. So, I thought about it, meditated on it, and this is what the Spirit gave me. Check this out. Jesus is about to prove to the readers, right, because we're reading, and the sisters here in the story, because she's going uh, to call Mary next, say, he's asking for you, <laughs> and she's going to do the same thing. She's going to get up and run to him, and everyone else, because we know the Jews are there, that he can do above, abo abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And this made me think of the Ephesian prayer that Paul gives in 3.20. And here it is. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to his power that is working in us. He is praying to the Ephesians, Paul is praying to the Ephesians, that they will see this type of, of miracles in their life because that power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in the Ephesians right? He also dwells in the Romans, right? It also dwells in us because that made the word of God for us to read, right? So we are to believe that. Back to this story. What is Jesus about to do? He's about to prove that he can do above and beyond what, what they can even ask or think. 
the miracle of the resurrection is going to happen today. So, internet people, we'll leave you with that. It get, get, leaves you with a lot of good stuff to chat and, and talk about, and that's what we're going to do here. So, we'll let you guys go.